afternoon and welcome to this special live call-in edition of Hardfire. My name is Laura Jo Anderson and with me today is Dr. Steve Finger, a Brooklyn ear, nose, throat and facial plastic surgery physician. Um, today's edition of Hardfire is a call-in show, so if you have a question for Dr. Finger, please call the number on your screen. Dr. Finger, welcome to Hardfire. Thank you, Laura Jo. It's a pleasure to be here. On an earlier edition of the program, uh, you discussed the topic of organ sales, and I'd like to start our discussion um, there today. Uh, first of all, could you tell me what, what's the problem with people donating organs? Well, presently, all organs are donated voluntarily. There's no monetary exchange. But as most people know, there's a tremendous shortage of organs. The, the problem is no longer organ uh, rejection the way it once was. Now, organ rejection has been handled reasonably well, and the problem is a shortage of organs. Uh, many people don't realize this, but every year, 6,000 people in this country die waiting for kidney transplants. 6,000 deaths waiting for kidney transplants. And, um, we're, and the shortage seems to be getting worse. We're looking for ways to increase the supply. And many people now feel that perhaps if uh, people were allowed to sell their organs, uh, that might increase the supply significantly. Um, in related, well, in a question following up to that, if, if organs are bought, bought and sold, if we have a free market um, for, for the sale of organs, won't only people who have enough money uh, to purchase those organs be given transplants? What about, what about people who can't afford to purchase an organ? Right, well, that, that issue has been raised many times, but it really is not a problem because, first of all, if organs are sold, that doesn't mean that organs will still not be allowed to be donated. The same people who are donating their organs will still be able to donate their organs. Um, we, we, and this, this has been a very charitable country, and people do not expect to be compensated for everything. People give money and all sorts of uh, in-kind services. So it really won't eliminate that. And in fact, if we were to allow rich people to buy organs, the way the situation works now is anybody that needs a transplant is placed on a list. And the list sometimes varies from area to area. If a rich person were on the list and the rich person were able to purchase an organ from somebody else, uh, that rich person would come off the list and the rest of the list would move up. So the person that were, was purchasing the organ, of course, would be the main beneficiary, but so would everybody below him on the list. Um, that was a very good answer. Uh, Thank I, you, Laura <laughs> Uh, another question we might have is, uh, what, what sort of safeguards would there be for, uh, for these organs that are bought and sold? What sort of protection might be provided so that donors are not talked into selling organs that they, they need to live, so that no one uh, dies as a result of selling their organ? Well, that's a good question. It's been raised many times. Um, the answer is simply that we would have the same safeguards that we have now. Uh, now anybody that has surgery, any sort of surgery, is... is uh, is given informed consent, which can be quite lengthy. And anybody that was to be giving, or to be, was to be donating an organ would have to have the same informed consent. He would have to know all the risks, all the rewards. Um, he would have to know all the possible uh, complications that could be result from surgery like this. Um, and I don't think that would be really a major problem. I, we, we handle that with major surgery now. Well, why would it be a problem with organ donations? Uh, plus, we're not talking about organ donations only from living people. Uh, if organs were allowed to be sold, then the next of kin from a deceased person would be able to, uh, to, to sell the organs of the, of the estate. Um, and a person could, uh, could sell an organ, maybe get some sort of a tax break while he was alive. He could pledge his organ upon death, and uh, we might have some sort of a tax, uh, tax incentive for doing something like that. Um. I imagine that many people uh, watching might feel that, that this is an issue of morality as well. Um, you know, it's a very generous thing to donate one's organs, uh, and to, to save someone's life by giving an organ. Um, should, should money really be involved in a decision like this? Is it really moral to sell a part of your body? Well, that, that issue is raised all the time. I think we may have a caller. Uh, but I'll just briefly finish, finish answering Laura Joe's question, is the morality of this. I think, I think we should really try to keep morality out of the government because this sort of morality now is costing 6,000 people their lives every year while they're waiting for a donation. Do we have a caller now? Is there a caller? Okay, caller, can we have your question? 
caller. I guess the caller is going to be waiting. A little bashful. We have a bashful caller on the line. <laughs> anyway, continuing along with uh, Laura Joe's question until we get the caller back on the line. Um, money in this issue, in this case, would not be a major issue because there would be two parties to the transaction. There would be the buyer and there would be the seller. The purchaser, the purchaser, has a certain amount of money but does not have a kidney. The seller obviously doesn't have the money but does have a kidney. And if this transaction were allowed to be to be completed, the buyer would now have a kidney, the seller would have the money, and this is what we call in libertarian economics a win-win situation where both people benefit. There are no losers, there's no exploitation. Everybody gets what they want. I think we have a caller now. Caller, can you hear us? Okay, no caller. Okay, <laughs> then maybe we'll just continue along. Well, um, I think we've, we've talked thoroughly about the, the position of the libertarian position on organ sales. Let's, um, let's talk about drugs mm. uh, for a bit. Uh, first of all, we have a, a major drug war going on in the country. As we know, we hear uh, news items about the drug war every day. And, um, and I believe the libertarian position on this is for, for legal drugs to be legalized, correct? Right, for illegal drugs to be legalized. That's correct. Um, so my first question on this topic is, aren't but aren't drugs dangerous? Isn't it a matter of public safety uh, to keep these substances illegal? Well, that's an interesting question, and it's been raised many, many times, because what we see now when we see people who are using drugs is we see people who are using illegal drugs, drugs that have been regulated and prohibited by government. Um, and it's, it's very important, I think, for us to separate the effect of the drugs from the effect of the drug laws. For instance, heroin was a major problem at one time in this country, <clears throat> and to a certain extent still is, but heroin, heroin is metabolized to morphine. Morphine is a relatively safe drug. It's a rel we have a caller coming. We do have a caller. Okay, you can interrupt me any time, caller. In the meantime, <laughs> I'll just continue to answer Laura Joe's last question. Oh, hello, uh, doctor. Hello. hello. Hello, we can hear you. Okay. Guys, I have, I have a question for you. Um, Considering that the millions of people in this country who have no health insurance, what would the libertarian position be on helping these people? Uh, the coolest question is, what do we do about the people in this country who have no health insurance? Um, this question has been raised many times. And um, the number that's always bandied about is that there are 40 million people in this country who have no health insurance. Uh, and that sounds like a huge number. It is a very large number. But we have to keep in mind that there are 300 million people in this country, and 40 million is only 13 percent. So 87 percent of the population does have health insurance. 13 percent does not have health insurance. And the fact that they don't have health insurance does not mean that they don't get health care. It means that they pay for their health insurance. They, they pay for it as they would pay to have their car repaired or anything else repaired. Um, of the people that have no health insurance, some of them choose not to have health insurance. There are some people who are so poor, in part because taxes are so high, that they just can't afford to buy health insurance. But there are many people who choose to spend their expendable or their disposable income on things other than health insurance. And what a national health insurance would, in essence, do would be to force everybody to buy health insurance, even people that prefer not to buy health insurance. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that we, we call health insurance now is not really what has been referred to as health insurance. It's prepaid health care. Health insurance, uh, up until recent years, was thought of as what we now call catastrophic health insurance, which means people would purchase insurance in case there were a catastrophe, if you had a heart attack, God forbid, or uh, uh, any major operations. Um, you would have to be prepared for that. You would buy health insurance that would, that would pay for that. But day-to-day -day health care was paid for out of pocket, um, just as, as repairs are paid for out of pocket in an automobile. Nobody buys insurance to pay for the gas in their car, but people still have gas in their cars. They don't pay for, uh, they don't have insurance that covers oil changes. Oil gets changed. What they do purchase insurance for is having the car stolen or having an accident. And that is what health insurance was originally intended to do. Health insurance was a large number of people paying a small amount of money so that when somebody has a catastrophic illness, uh, they won't go bankrupt. But the day-to-day -day 
uh, health insurance, the day-to-day -day health expenditures are usually paid for out of pocket as they have been because that's just one of the expenses of living, health insurance, health care, food, shelter, and uh, Thank you very that answer your question, Caller? Yes, it did. Uh, Dr. Finger, as a follow-up, um, speaking of that, uh, uh, paying, paying for as you go along uh, in, in the medical world, um, do you think that medical care is too expensive for an average, um, an average American at this point? Uh, do the drug companies make too much money? Do doctors make too much money? Is there a way of Way of well, this? first of all, doctors don't make enough money. <laughs> I have to correct you there. Um, well, there are several answers to that. First of all, uh, the, 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 the best compensated people in the health insurance system are, of course, the doctors. Doctors make more money than anybody else in the health care system. We get paid more than nurses, more than orderlies, more than everybody else. Doctors' fees represent 20% 20 20 of the overall health care dollar. So if you were to cut doctors across the board by 25%, you'd say 5%. Um, so there really is not a lot of savings in, involved in that. As far as why the, the fees, why the health insurance is so high, I think it's a good rule of thumb that when something is going wrong in the country as a whole, you at least look to the government to see if government is in some way involved in driving up the costs. And I think that's very much the case with, um, with government in intervention in the healthcare system. The regulations of the healthcare system are not usually known to people outside the system, but they're enormous. For instance, uh, Medicare is a program for people over 65. Medicare has 100,000 pages of regulations, 100,000 pages of regulation. And that drives up the cost for people to become familiar with those things. Everything in the healthcare system is regulated. People can't buy anymore just a pure health insurance policy. The government mandates that it cover, um, it cover abuse substances, it cover care for psychiatric illnesses, and this drives up the care. Somebody that wants to buy just plain health insurance in case they really get sick, you really can't do it anymore. Plus, the government adds to the cost, the day-to-day -day cost. Um, I don't know how many people remember, it was 15 or 20 years ago, uh, a big issue was made of, of, of dirty needles. I, I can remember the governor of New Jersey walking along the beach of New Jersey and holding up a couple of needles and saying these, these needles, they threaten the, wealth, the, health, the, the health of the population. And as a result, as a result uh, the government has mandated that anything that touches any patient, that touches any kind of blood, has to be handled separately. It costs a fortune for all those things, and it doesn't do any good for anybody. We have another call, I believe. Caller? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I missed the beginning of the program, so I'm not sure if you can address anything like this yet. I'm having trouble. We're not hearing you that well. Can you turn up the volume a little bit? Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, I yes, hear you. Yes, I can. Thanks. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could address from a libertarian point of view uh, the idea of government coverage for contraceptives or abortion as opposed to, you know, either creating... I think, the, I think the question was whether or not government should cover contraceptions and cover abortions. Um, we're really questioning whether government should cover anything. And whether they cover contraceptions or they cover abortions or they cover erectile dysfunction, uh, that's usually something that's decided by the majority of the people uh, who just impose their will on everybody else. I, I don't think there's any right or wrong answer. I think there are libertarians who believe, uh, believe abortion should be legal. There are libertarians who believe abortion should be illegal. There are libertarians who believe in contraception. There are libertarians who believe just the opposite. And there really is no right or wrong answer. If you were to purchase your own health insurance, you could make those decisions by yourself with your own money. And that's that's... I think that would be a much less expensive and a much more efficient healthcare system, and that's what we really advocate. Your, you use your money for your choice to decide what you want to purchase, not have somebody take the money from you. Um, there are a lot of people in this country who regard abortion to be murder, and to ask them to give their money to, to fund abortion, um, I, I think there's a, there's a question as to whether that should be done. So but buy your own health insurance. I'm sorry, go ahead. To be unwanted children and children whose parents can't 
I, I'm having trouble hearing you there. Isn't it bad for the whole society for there to be unwanted children and children whose parents can't take care of okay. them? I can't. And that burden falls to everybody else. Did you hear what you said? I'm sorry, I, I'm really, I didn't hear the follow-up question there. Could you just speak a little louder or somebody turn up the volume in the control center? I'll try to call back. I hear you now. I heard you now. Just speak like that. Go ahead. Um, isn't, it, um, isn't it better for government to provide contraception or abortion rather than uh, there be more unwanted children and children whose parents can't care for them, the burden of which falls on the rest of society? Right. I, I hear your question. I understand. You're, you're basically asking two separate questions. You're basically asking, is it better for abortion and contraception to be provided by somebody? And the second part of your question is whether it should be provided by government. As to the first part, personally, I agree with you. I think that abortion on demand, I have, I, my religious and ethical beliefs do not interfere with, with allowing abortion. I don't think that's my business. I respect people who disagree with me, but personally, I have no problem with that. And as far as contraception, that's even a few steps back. So I personally believe that these should be available on demand, and uh, abortion on demand and contraception. And I, I agree with the premise of your question that the society as a whole, that people in general, if we can regard society as a, uh, as a whole, would be better off if this were the case. The second part of your question is whether government should fund this. Personally, I don't believe that should be the case. Because remember, when you talk about government funding something, we're not talking about this ev avuncular, kindly old gentleman who comes down and takes care of people and gives them the things that they want. The way government works, we, we've abrogated to government the right to use force to extract taxation. So you're asking whether government should force some people to pay money to pay for abortions for other people. And I, I, for all the reasons that we just discussed, I don't agree with that premise. But I think that I, I agree with you that abortions and contraception uh, should, should not be outlawed. They should be freely available. And I think in this country and the world as a whole, in my view, uh, we, we, we would have a better world if that were the case. Does that answer your question? I hope. OK. I think we were talking about drugs before we were interrupted. If there's another caller, just let us know. Is there another caller? A caller? There's a caller for Laura Jo. <laughs> OK. Yes, caller? Yes. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? We can hear you. OK. I was calling to find out how I could um, get more information about the Lib Libertarian Party in Brooklyn. Oh, uh, I believe the caller's question was about a, uh, a chapter of the Libertarian Party in Brooklyn. And, and we do have a libertarian group that meets in Brooklyn about the third Wednesday of every month. Uh, and if you'd like details, uh, if you'd like to meet uh, fellow Brooklyn libertarians, please go to the Hardfire website. That's www.hardfire.net, where you'll find all the details about, about our, um, our Brooklyn libertarian group. Okay. Do we have okay. another caller on the line? No, then I'll OK, we'll then we'll just continue. Our we were talking <coughs> before the last caller called. We were talking about drugs, and we were talking about the deleterious effects of drugs. And the point that I was making was that we have to, we have to really separate the effects of the drugs from the effects of the drug laws. What we're seeing now, when we see a junkie laying in the street, or people's lives who have been ruined, we're seeing the effect of the confluence of both of them. We're seeing the drugs and the drug laws. This is somewhat like the kind of prohibition that we had in this country with alcohol prohibition. But I think if we're going to discuss drugs intelligently and what should be done about them, we have to separate the effect of the drugs from the effect of the drug laws. And I mentioned the, uh, the instance of heroin. Heroin is, was a drug of choice in this country for many years. Now there's more crack cocaine. Other things have taken its place, but we still see a lot of heroin. The effect of heroin, heroin is metabolized to morphine, which is a very commonly used drug in medicine. We use it to relieve pain, um, mainly to, to relieve pain. And we know the effects of the of morphine, and these can be handled very well. Uh, overdoses of, hero, of of morphine can cause respiratory dis depression, uh, gastrointestinal stomach problems. But ordinarily, morphine that's used appropriately 
is a relatively safe drug. The problem that we're having now with heroin is the effect of the drug laws. First of all, the most obvious is the fact that people cannot purchase needles. They can't purchase needles legally. I think in New York that's changed, although it's not that well known. But the, for many, many years, needles were outlawed. People had to share needles, and we had this HIV AIDS epidemic, not as a result of the heroin, but as a result of the laws that prevented people from buying clean needles. Secondly, there are all kinds of infections that people get from heroin. Uh, we see heart infections, typically called endocarditis, which is a very serious infection, infection in the heart. does not come from heroin. does not come from morphine. It comes from dirty needles, and it comes from contaminants. We see overdoses, huge numbers of overdoses. The reason for the overdoses is because people can't regulate the amount of me medication that they're getting. If you buy morphine, it comes in a little bottle, and the, it tells you just exactly how much is in there. You know exactly what you're getting. You buy heroin on the street, you have no idea what's happening and what you're getting, and we have these overdoses. So we have infections, we have HIV, we have overdoses. Um, these are all the effects of the drug laws. They're not the effect of the drug itself. And then the most important thing to many people is all the crime that's associated with drugs. People commit crimes who are on drugs not because drugs make them criminals, although crack cocaine does have effects on people to, um, to sometimes do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. Most of the reason for the crime is because government regulation, government laws have so inflated the price of drugs that people have to spend their, their entire life committing crimes to get money to pay for their drugs. Um, I was just reading someplace that heroin, that, that powdered heroin is, is actually cheaper to produce than salt and sugar. And I'm not sure if that's exactly true, but it's, it's probably, probably on the mark. It's probably very close to the actual situation. Uh, if you look at the, all the interdiction efforts that are made to wipe out the poppy, the poppy seeds all over the world, this stuff grows any place. And it could be very cheap to, pr to produce. But government, by, by giving us these laws, raises the prices, makes people go out and commits crimes, causes a whole industry in illegal drugs. Um, there's no illegal drugs in, in milk chocolate around the, the schools because you don't make any money selling chocolate bars to kids, but you make a fortune selling drugs. And if the drugs were, would be cheap, nobody would be bothering to push these drugs on kids. So I think it's important basically uh, to separate the effects of the drugs from the effects of the drug laws. And I, I think most people who analyze this dispassionately will come to the conclusion that the, most of the things that we detest about drugs are the effects of the drug laws rather than the drugs, which does not mean that libertarians advocate the use of drugs. Personally, I don't inhale, <laughs> and I haven't used drugs, not since college, and even then it was once or twice. I don't use drugs. I, I think that they're not really good for people. Um, my children don't use drugs, and I would not encourage them to use it. And I would, I would, I would uh, tell anybody who's thinking of it that they should not use these illicit drugs, but that's just my business. And I don't think that I should impose my opinion on everybody else. Thank you, Dr. Steve. That was a, a wonderful assessment of uh, the drug situation in this country. Um, I think we probably have time to touch on one more topic um, or take a couple more calls. It's not too late to call in. If you have a question for Dr. Steve, uh, please call the number on your screen. And um, in the meantime, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about assisted suicide. Let's just make a, a brief comment uh, on that. Uh, should an individual be allowed to take his own life uh, with the aid of a doctor, or is this, uh, is this really murder? Well, suicide is obviously a very serious problem for very many people. It's not something that we can make light of. When a person gets to the point in their life that death is, rather, is, is better than living, then obviously they're suffering a horrible life, um, and it's not something that we should, we should take lightly. However, an individual does own his own body. An individual owns his own life, owns his own body, and if he chooses to take his life, uh, that's really his business. We can try to dissuade him, but we really can't try to stop him. As far as doctor-assisted suicide, which I, I think has been passed in Oregon and is being opposed by the federal government for, for some reason, um, I'm not sure if I personally would like to be involved in assisting a suicide, but uh, I, I don't see any, any problem with another doctor doing that. Uh, people who are, who are involved in doctor-assisted suicide are basically people who
who have terminal illnesses, who are suffering terrible, terrible pain, terrible suffering. And um, I, I, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't help to put them out of their misery, if that's their choice, if that's their choice. I don't, I don't believe in euthanasia. I don't think that we should, we should make the decision for these people. But if they make the decision, if they're competent to make the decision, uh, if we look at the physicians and family see that the, it, it's an appropriate decision, then um, I, I think that it's, uh, that, it's, that it's fine to do that and the government should not be involved in, in situations of such a personal nature. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who called in to our show today, uh, and I'd like to thank Dr. Steve especially for so expertly answering those calls. Um, you're watching Hard Fire again. If you'd like to find out more information about this program or about the Libertarian Party, uh, please visit www.hardfire.net. Oh, and I think we have one more caller on the line. Yes. We do. Caller, can you hear us? Yes. What's the question, caller? I'd like to know why they didn't um, use alcohol as a drug. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you speak a little bit louder? Alcohol? What about alcohol? Why is that not labeled as a drug? Why is it not illegal as a drug? Right. Well, that's what I, I was referring to with the drug laws. Alcohol at one time was illegal as a drug. And that's what gave us organized crime in this country. In the 20s, we had pro alcohol prohibition. Um, and uh, alcohol, price of alcohol went up. We had a whole crime industry that began in that time and has perpetuated itself to the present time. We have exactly the same situation with drugs. We have the drug cartels who, that are corrupting governments all over the world, uh, corrupting uh, the judicial system, and uh, the sooner we get rid of that and let people live their own lives, make their own decisions for themselves, the better off I think we'll all be. Uh, thanks, everyone, for watching Hard Fire. That's all the time we have for today. Uh, please be sure to watch Hard Fire at its regular time slot, which is Monday night at 10.30. That's tomorrow night at 10.30, right here on the same channel.